Fred Cannon is going to be speaking on humanly humanity adapting to climate change and humanity affecting the environment. Welcome, Fred. Good morning. Am I on? I'm on. Okay. Hello, I'm Fred Cannon, and my talk is Humanity Adapting to Climate Change and Humanity Affecting the Environment. That doesn't work. This green button. That doesn't work. Oh, it just takes a while? Okay. So uh, let's look at a broad view of the Hebrew translation. Let's start with Genesis through Deuteronomy was written with 1,550 root words. I've counted them. English has a million words. The cat in the hat was written with 230 words. So how do you say things that are as deep and profound as Moses said with only about seven times as many words as the cat in the hat has? The way Moses did it, he used words that had broad meanings. Every single word is like a picture. It's worth about a thousand words. We tend to translate words by their perceived 1850s meanings. That has the implication of the literal translation is, but what I see is it's the narrow translation is. But if God and Moses had wanted to summarize what we know now from science about creation in a page and a half, what words would they have used? Small words? Yes. Big words like evolution, oxygen, wouldn't have existed. Would they have compiled words that indeed appear in the Torah? I think the answer is yes. So let's view Genesis 1 as God's bar of creation through six cycles of progressions. So these are included in the definitions of these three words. And there was Erev, evening, that's dim, vague, despair, the kind of thing you expect if, when it's night and you don't have electricity. There was Boker, morning, dawning of hope, new things coming, new plants growing. Uh, Yom daylighting, not look at the time so much as the condition of daylight. And there's a burst of energy and proliferation of light. And let's focus on how God used all three environmental progressions, not on the cycles progressions or time durations. And by the way, science uses also these progressions if you look at it, like the time that uh, uh, the Yucatan impact was blasted with a meteorite or comet starting uh, uh, the change from dinosaurs to mammal-type life. Uh, there's several meanings of Adam. Adam can mean humanity, uh, or it can mean an individual named Adam, or it can mean man, or it can mean human. So Genesis 1, 26 to 31, can be about God bar creating Adam humanity, and by the way, that could have been taken, God could have invested thousands or millions of years in that, or a time that we haven't even figured out yet. And Genesis 2 to 4 can be about very real people named Adam and Eve and an Eden refuge where they spoke with God and sinned. Uh, several people have showed temperature changes and we talk about the Anthropocene, that's World War II. The bomb was blasting in air, caused a change in temperature and ever since then, we've thought of all sorts of ways to blast things. Every time you drive a car, you're moving, a, moving around in something that's blasting. Uh, but the, from the time of Christ, temperatures have been pretty steady, and then they've gone up. 1.2 degrees since 1900. Uh, and then if we looked at the longer range, and, and Terry just showed this, we see this kind of thing, and this comes from Antarctic ice cores. And I want to focus on three time frames. One is right here, about 95,000 years ago. One is here, 60 to 75,000 years ago. And then this is a broad arrow, because I don't want to be too specific. But I think Adam and Eve were in here and had a very specific blessing. 
Okay, so higher is more CO2, higher temperature, and that's how that goes. And then that's affected the sea level. So uh, about 60 to 75,000 years ago, the sea level was 300 feet lower than it now is. And that's impacted what humans have been doing. Um, and then uh, can we view the past to anticipate the future? So Jessica was talking about this time frame, which, which scientists call the mid Brunhees event or MIS 11. And a lot of people are looking at, well, is there similarity between this and this? So a lot of this is driven by what we call the Milankovitch cycles, which were calculated by hand, by the way, by a, a Czech person in, in, uh, in the communist area, but a Christian. Uh, and uh, Milankovitch cycles have to do with Earth's tilts and wobbles and cycling around the sun. And I can't show you the next three slides because I requested permission to show them and I haven't received word back yet. But this cycle here looks, I should say up to right here, looks a whole lot like this when you blow it up. The next question is what happens from here? Do we go like this? Or, or do we go up? Do we go down? We can affect that. And that's what a lot about climate change is about. So here's the three card slides I can't show you. Uh, oh, I went too far. Okay, I can show you this slide with permission from PLS Clear. So as, as was pointed out yesterday, um, this has been the most uh, 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 unchanging climate we've ever had. All of these ups and downs, that's hard to live in. You take the derivative of that and you get these kind of curves and it's been like that until about 1950. And then this curve doesn't show it, but boom, we're going right back up again. If this was so difficult to live in, why do we want to create a climate that's so difficult to live in? Why are we doing that to ourselves? So uh, the other thing to point out is that humanity survived in South Africa about 60 to 75,000 years ago. And there's uh, climatic and geographic reasons why that has a different climate than the rest of, of Africa. So while the rest of Africa was very dry and cold, South Africa was not. And we'll come back and talk about that a little bit. Uh, so lessons and opportunities we learn from paleoclimates. Climate is linked in part to the Milanchevic cycles. We cannot influence that. As, a, as CO2 goes, so goes climate. We can and we must influence that. We burn coal and oil at a rate of one third of a million years of deposits per year of our civilization. This is not sustainable. There's not much left. Now, every year, there's this uh, process, dance, of people saying, well, we have to raise the national debt so we have deficit spending. We cannot have deficit oiling. So, are we the prodigal son? Are we squandering the wealth that our Father, God in heaven, gave us? Where has sapiens wisdom gotten us? Uh, I can't have, I don't have time to go into this, but uh, uh, the vast majority of uh, handwritten manuscripts say, for from one man, ethnic, every ethnic group of humans came, God made. And that's what uh, science is now saying uh, through uh, paleogenetics and so on. We have one blood of Adam humanity. That's the Genesis 1 in Acts 17, 26. Uh, human, humanity. There's a little bit of archaic Homo sapien, Neanderthal, and Zisavin that comes into that, but that's the one blood. All, everybody in the whole world has less genetic diversity than the chimpanzees do, or than the coyotes do, uh, which is really pretty surprising and amazing. Uh, Genesis 126 says, let us make Adam humanity in our Selim image. Bible scholars ask, what traits show Adam humanity is in God's image? Anthropologists ask the same question, but they word it differently. 
How did Homo sapiens become sapiens wise? So sapiens means wise. So both of us are looking for traits of wisdom, compassion, ability to communicate, to engineer materials, to share learning, to visualize past and future. Uh, and anthropologists talk about the ability to visualize God. Uh, so here's an example of compassion. This is 95,000 years ago. Uh, and there's a cave called Cave Cave. It's in Israel. And there's, a, there's five skulls there. And one of them is of a 12-year-old who somehow suffered a blow to a skull that caused a one-inch hole in his skull. But the significant thing is a lot of that has grew back in, which means he kept living or she kept living uh, beyond this blow. So how could a child have survived with a one inch hole in their skull? Uh, our, our anthropologist, uh, Coco Guet, thinks the child survived because of the compassion of relatives and the clan that was also in that cave that took care of that child for quite some time. Is this compassion in the image of God? Now, this becomes pretty interesting because that cave is two miles from Nazareth, Israel. What else happened in Nazareth? Jesus was born there. So when Jesus was a 12-year-old child, did he explore this cave? And was he aware of the 12-year-old child that had this hole in the brain? Interesting question. So, by the way, these five full skeletons of Kesav Cave from this time frame are the most skeletons found in one place from that time period or earlier anywhere in the world. Uh, and then South Africa becomes a very interesting place, uh, both from genetics and from what was going on there. So genetics seems to indicate that all humans came from one blood, and the genetics somehow traces that down to it might have been here. Uh, Maureen thinks that that's where uh, the, the, this one blood was. But interestingly, at that time, with the uh, water level 300 feet lower, there was a whole coastal plain here that animals like zebras and all the other things you think of in Africa could live there. It was a mild savanna climate compared to the dry, cold climate in a lot of other places. There's a lot of big game, uh, and there's indications that the human cultures were not only getting shellfish, but the kind of shellfish you can only get at low tides. So this exposed coastal plain uh, was a place that was, a, shall we say, a mini Africa, as we now think of it. Uh, and this, uh, anthropologists and archaeologists talk about the Still Bay and Howison port cultures from this time frame. And... Uh, they were able to make these kinds of spear points by taking a certain kind of rock and heating it up to 600 degrees Fahrenheit in a campfire and then napping that to form these very intricate kinds of uh, spear points that, that became commonplace much later. Uh, also, we can find uh, remnants of ostrich eggshells there that have these cross marks here like this. And so people wonder, well, ostrich eggshells, they're as big as a canteen. Were they using these as canteens? And that were these marks saying, uh, hey, Tom Smith has this one, stuff like that. Uh, so these humans exhibited wisdom, compassion. They understood the tides when it would be lowest tide and they could get the shellfish they wanted. They were sharing the learning and the sharing how to engineer the fire. Uh, there's examples that, uh, you know, maybe uh, quite a bit earlier they were doing this, but not very often, but they were learning from each other how to do this. So they are, are they wise in the image of God would be a question. Uh, and then there's, a, a, from genetics, we're getting the impression that there was a crossing of the Red Sea at about the same time, 75 to 60,000 years ago. And at that time, where the darker color shows how much lower the, the water level was. Uh, they had a two mile wide opening to cross. Um, and these are the haplogroups that uh, seem to have crossed there. So God must really like Red Sea crossings. Maybe this is where Moses crossed the Red Sea. 
Genesis 2.5, let's move uh, further in time. No plant had sprung up. God had not caused it to rain. No man to work the ground. Is this the context of the younger Dryas interrupting the inception of the Neolithic uh, transition? The younger Dryas is characterized by cold, glacial, harsh, dry deserts. Uh, a lot of Africa was during this time was uh, very dry. Uh, and the Arctic dryas flower was proliferating in southern Europe at, at this time frame. Uh, by the way, these are pictures of that same uh, plant now growing in Alaska, and my son and I have observed those. Uh, so the deteriorating younger dryas has been linked uh, by Archelaus to higher pressure on food resources, lower population densities, lower birth rates, more human wandering. So did, was Adam one of these wanderers that went into the Garden of Eden. And where is that Garden of Eden? So it talks about four rivers. The Tigris and Euphrates are still there. Uh, the Pishon uh, comes from the land of Havilah, which a lot of people think is here. And much gold was there, which, which uh, was, a, uh, uh, was a motivator for uh, the Muslim faith uh, moving out from all over. Uh, is that now Wadi al Batan? And then, uh, then the Gihon comes from the land of Kush. Let's focus on the, the uh, consonants, since both Arabic and uh, Hebrew are consonantal languages. Uh, there's an archaeological site that's called Ali Kosh. It's in the middle of Kuzakstan. Hear, hear all that sound? So the question is, could Eden have been in this area? And let's say it was about 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. We don't know when it was. But at that time, 12,000 years ago, because of the lower water levels, the shoreline of the Persian Gulf was here in the, in the bright red, and uh, 10,000 years ago in the orange red. And this fellow named Rose surmised that there could have been civilizations all throughout here, or people living all throughout here. So can we not find Eden? Can, can we not get back to Eden because it's now buried in the Persian Gulf? Genesis 2.15, uh, and, and so on, gives us a context for maybe when Adam and Eve lived in the garden, worked the land, bred, keeper of sheep, work of the ground, built a, and the word is ear, which can mean settlement of about 100 to 300 people. Uh, and that's, are these indicators that Adam, Eve, and their children were participating in the Neolithic demographic transition and were possibly the early initiators of it. So this is a transition from gatherers to farmers, from hunters to shepherds, from nomads to life in these 100 to 300 person settlements. And these settlements were emerging in the Fertile Crescent. Okay, let's go to the word shepherding. John 10 has Jesus saying, I'm the good shepherd. I'm not the wolf. I'm not the hired hand. Ezekiel 34 has maybe one of the first uh, wordings of, that has to do with pollution. You trod in your feet and muddy the water. Must my sheep drink what you have trodden? So how do we be good shepherds? And uh, Jessica talked a lot about this, so I'm just going to tell you there's some good news and some bad news. Okay, several people have been talking about the Anthropocene, the climate heating in 52 years, the good news, it will be over. Can we get a round of applause for that? Okay. Now the bad news, the why. We won't have any more oil or natural gas left. Okay, so there's only 51 years of oil left, 53 years of natural gas left, 114 years of coal left. There's no such thing as deficit oiling. You know who made this map? The CIA. Okay, so while, our, while you're driving down the road and oblivious to why it's costing $7 a gallon for gas, and why senators and congressmen are arguing about whether we really have climate change or not, the CIA is very concerned about this. Think about that. Okay, the bad, this is the bad news unless 
We, re, re, we uh, foster renewable energy. Okay, so here's a pretty cool graph. This is a very exciting graph. Coal has gone like this. Nuclear has gone pretty close to flat. We are now creating more electricity with renewable energy than we are with either coal or with nuclear energy. Did I say that right? More, more with renewables, which is hydro, solar, and wind. So half of this is hydro, and it's been pretty constant. But we're starting to get an S shape like this for um, solar and wind. Not only that, but a cool thing is that wind and solar costs less than any of the other ways to generate electricity. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And that's happened just in the past 10 years. Okay, so here's a question for all of us. Do the number of solar panels and wind turbines you see now today annoy you? I ask my students these questions. If you saw 10 to 20 times as many, would that annoy you? Because with 10 to 20 times, we could accommodate most all of our energy needs. Uh, and not only that, but solar, and I'm just picking one out of many things that we can do. Energy is, the solar power is energy for the little guy or gal. So you can be, live in a hut like this, put out a solar panel, get a computer, and you're, you're, you're hooked in with the, with, with the world economy. Our uh, solar panels can serve the dual purpose on a, wind, uh, on a roof. Um, you, you can take fallow lands, become useful. So, in overview, like God protected Moses in the reed basket, so God has protected humanity through many climate upheavals. That, that's what we see when there's the ups and downs and humans existed through all of that. We are now using oil and coal at a rate of one-third of a million years of deposit per year of our life. We are changing Earth's climate. Congress cannot vote for deficit oiling of more oil and coal than exists. We can find a little bit more. We can open uh, oil reserves in Alaska or you know, fight over who gets to have the oil reserves from a, you know, disputed lands. But there's not more than got there a long time ago. The science and engineering exists for us to pull ourselves out of this, so let's do it. So if you have any, these are the references and citations I have for this. If you have any questions, you can ask Fred the Neanderthal. But first, I want to remind everybody that we have added a third session with Fred Cannon and Jessica Mormon um, for this, a third talk for this session. So if you're interested, they're going to continue the discussion on stewardship. So hang around. Was there a question over here? Thank you. Um, thank you for the talk, Fred. Very interesting. Nice to see all the figures and the work that you've done here. Um, my question is related to something you showed recently. Um, this, the figure you showed with oil being depleted within 50 years is striking. Have you ever heard of that? Has anybody told you about that? No one said that, and I want you to You haven't justify talked to the CIA it. recently, huh? Yeah, no, I haven't been. <laughs> okay. Can you, can you tell me about the methods that they're using to come up with that number, and how accurate do you think it is? Uh. What's going on? Oh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you something different. My wife uh, uh, smuggled a life into the F, uh, a knife into the FBI to cut cheese. So anyway, um, I'll tell you that it's a long story for you here. Um, no, but I I think this is a compilation of a lot of people's data. You know, maybe. You know, how do you, how do you squeeze more water out of a turnip? You know, the, the earth is a pretty darn big turnip, but it has a limited amount of water stuck in it. So can we move that from 51 years to 55 years? Probably. Again, with continuing usages, uh, can, can probably coal's going to go down while natural gas goes up is the general trend. 
But the big thing is, whether it's 51 years or 60 years, it's not 100 years. It's not 1,000 years. It's not longer than I, I anticipate you to live. Um, if you live a, a typical life. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Terry. Yep. Oh, all right. I, I, I guess, yeah. I, I just wanted to follow up on, on that same question there. Um, ever since I was a teenager, I've been hearing, we're, we're, we're running out of oil. We only have 10 years left. We have 20 years left. We have 30 years left. And yet they keep discovering more and more and more oil. So I would like to see a, uh, a, a something showing how much has been the estimate of, of the amount of oil, you know, and gas in the world versus time, because it, it keeps going up. And that's now I agree with you, your overall point. I, I doubt if there's more than one, maybe 200 years left, if that. But but, you know, still to to make it so sound so definite of 52 years, I my my oh, I, I, to me, I really doubt that that number. So that that's okay. where my from. So here's the question. Do you two live in different congressional districts? You're at Caltech. Where are you? San Diego. Okay, you both could run for Congress on, on that platform. <laughs> uh, Terry? I, I just wanted to comment. That might be true, those numbers you have up there. I don't think we can afford to burn that 50 years worth of oil or 50 years worth of natural gas or 114 years of, of coal in terms of putting uh, additional CO2 into the uh, into the atmosphere. Uh, so I, you know, I think uh, as much as, you know, we, we're confident that we're going to run out, uh, we can't afford to burn it all uh, in terms of the environmental impact that the, the, the CO2 will have if we do burn it all. Yeah. So this discussion reminds me of this, the, the five steps of grief towards dying. The first is denial. Um, something to think about. Okay. Yeah, I think we need to believe the numbers. I happen to come from Trinidad and Tobago, which 10 years ago was, 12 years ago, was producing 80% of the natural gas used in the U.S. came from Trinidad, a tiny little island on top of Venezuela. When my husband and I were recruited to Trinidad to help start the manufacturing engineering program at the University of Trinidad and Tobago, we were told the expectation was 14 years of crude oil in the waters around Trinidad. That oil ran out in, I think, 2012 or 2013. I don't know how many million barrels are left the, the production, the search for oil, British gas, all the multinationals, <laughs> which come and in general, when you're trying to find oil on your own land, that's one thing. When you're trying to find oil in places where developed world <laughs> folk are living, we are not happy with the ways in which you come to do it. So they've now found oil in Guyana, which has moved down, and in Suriname, which has moved further south, the amounts of oil that are being found are minimal. So when they tell you we expect worldwide 50 years of oil, oil has gone in Trinidad. We've closed down four oil refineries, which is not a bad thing because Trinidad and Tobago was second in the world in terms of per capita contribution to um, greenhouse gases, second in the world behind China. So there are all kinds of deleterious effects. Those numbers are real, guys. Yeah, so uh, when you look at, here's Trinidad and Tobago, you do have a little bit left according to the CIA. Um, how, how many of these countries are we at odds with is something to think about. The other thing to think about is, uh, uh, you know, uh, how many of these countries are the have countries and how many of the have not countries? And are the have countries taking advantage of the have not countries? Uh, by the way, I had a, a grad student from Trinidad and Tobago, wonderful country. Um, 
when, when my daughter was in uh, high school, she came home and said, Dad, should we open up Alaska to oil exploration? And I said, I'll, I'll give you an answer that you probably haven't heard. The answer is no, because then when all the rest of the world's out of oil, we'll still have some. But anyway. <laughs> um, just wanted to point out, this is only showing crude oil, so it's not including shale oil. And it's probably only the known reserves. I, I think by definition, you can't estimate how much the unknown is on this chart. So there's, there's probably more than is shown on this chart. What, where are you from? Uh, California. What, which, which congressional district? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that affects the facts of what is shown on the chart. Okay. So the point is... I'm just messing with your yeah. guys' heads. Come on. Yeah, the, the point is I think there's more than what's shown there, but it would be very expensive to get a lot of that out. So the economics makes it uneconomic at this time. Okay, Veronica? I just want to make a comment of wonder. So I really loved how you were talking about, like, just describing like, you know, Eden and like where it could possibly be. And when you were talking about the like, these, like the image of God and and being found in compassion with the like Kafsa cave and the skull, um, it just really reminded me of that phrase where they said, can anything good come from Nazareth? And it was like, Instead of, you know, like that's something that we see in God's word and it's based on like, you know, everything from like the Old Testament. Like we can understand why people are kind of like, oh, Nazareth, meh. But like it was like this is God's word in the creation, in the history of the creation. Like this, you know, like in, um, in these like in archaeology, right? That somebody's asking, can anything good come from you know, what we're finding in terms of human compassion in the past. So I found, I saw that link and it was really beautiful. Oh, that's cool. So can anything good come from Nazareth? Nath Nathaniel and, and this, this little kid's relatives. That's cool, I like that. That's good. We're gonna have time for more questions, but let's go ahead and move into our third talk. Mm -hmm.